The fight for 15 may be the biggest economic divide between Donald Trump and the working class. Trump rode a wave of populism to the White House, and during last week's inaugural address, he tapped nationalistic themes like buy American and hire American. But critics say most of his economic policies fly in the face of economic fairness. So, with the president, that's the new president, trying to have it both ways, pro-business and pro-worker, how will activists navigate the Trump administration? Joining us to dig into the approach of activists in the age of Trump is a representative of a key progressive group based right here in Brooklyn. Ari Kamen is the political director of the New York Working Families Party. Welcome to BK Live. Thanks, Thanks for, for joining us. Thanks Ari. for having me. Thanks yeah. for being here, Ari. Now, as an activist, well, first, I want to start in the present. We're in this first week of the Trump administration, and you attended the Women's March this past Saturday on his first day in office here in Manhattan. As an activist, where did that event rank with the others you've participated in through the years? Well, it was by far the largest one I've ever been at. I think I read afterwards that there are 400,000 people in New York City marching. Um, you know, I've been to Black Lives Matter protests, Occupy Wall Street. Uh, immigrant rights protests, but uh, I've never quite seen anything like this. And it wasn't just in New York, reflected across the country, uh, the world, in fact. Re uh, there were reported 3.3 million people who marched in over 500 cities around the country, by far the largest uh, anti-presidential protest in American history. So was it an anti-presidential protest, or was it a pro-workers, pro-women, pro-issues? I think in the con I think in the context of Donald Trump, those yeah. are the same thing. Okay. Uh, if you're for workers, then you're against the pres uh, President Trump and his uh, policies and his administration. Yeah. If you're for women's rights, you're against President Trump's policies and administration. If you're for immigrant rights, yeah. Muslim rights. Uh, you're against the president and his administration. So I think in the age of Trump, the way we see it, uh, those things are the same at this point. So the Working Families Party has made some amazing inroads in New York City in particular. You got a citywide elected in office on the ticket and the way that you guys split the ballot as well. So how can you use that momentum from an action like Saturday into pushing those sort of progressive policies and plans forward? Sure. Uh, in terms of uh, space for activists, mm -hmm. uh, we've set up these Resist Trump Tuesday events. Uh, every Tuesday, a uh, group of people come out and protest uh, Donald Trump. What did you do yesterday? I think we actually had about 1,000 people at Chuck Schumer's office demanding that he uh, uh, not uh, confirm President Trump's nominees for his cabinet. Um, there were 300 people in Philadelphia. Uh, people all over the country were out doing this. On a call Monday night, a planning call that we had around the country, uh, 30,000 people got on the call. These are numbers we've never seen before. There you go. Yeah. Um, so there is extraordinary energy around standing up to this guy and his misogynistic and xenophobic and racist uh, administration. And, I mean, let's overlay this with s Saturday's uh, protests and what you did Tuesday with the economy, like the Occupy movement. That did wake some people up to, you know, income, uh, not income equality, sorry, economic inequality. Mm -hmm. What did you learn, good and bad, from the Occupy movement that you can now relate to the next four years protesting Trump and human rights? Sure. Uh, you know, I think what Occupy was able to do is, uh, like you said, really bring to light income inequality, economic inequality, uh, to the point that it became a dominant theme in the presidential race, whether it was in the primary between Bernie and Hillary, or even in the general, where I think a lot of the stuff Trump was talking about was you know, stolen to a certain extent, or it reflected the uh, anger and frustration that a lot of folks from Occupy had around wealth being concentrated in the top, power being concentrated at the top, the system and government uh, completely being rigged for the wealthy as opposed to regular working people. So I, I think that kind of woke people up to the reality of, of uh, inequality in America. And I, and I think that is a big driving force behind the anti-Trump activism that we're seeing now. So a lot of people uh, in the popular media will talk about uh, Occupy fizzling and that it was something that started with the bang, but now there's not been any substantive sort of actions that came out of that. But I think you take a different view of those actions. Sure. I mean, uh, you know, since Occupy, uh, Mayor de Blasio in his first run ran on income inequality. Yeah. Uh, that was his major platform, and he became to, mayor of New York City. Yeah. <laughs> and he became mayor of New York City from it. Uh, Bernie Sanders ran a campaign on income inequality and general political inequality, and he got close to being the nominee for president of the United States because of it. So, yeah. you know, the folks who camped out uh, in Zuccotti Park uh, might not no longer be camping out in Zuccotti Park, but I think the issues that they were able to bring to light 
have really shifted the political discourse in the country in a, in a profound way. And I mean, Brian mentioned the media to play devil's advocate a little more. I know a lot of people online and the media and politicians were critical. I mean, it's not a lot of people, but people were upfront and critical with the marches yeah. on Saturday, depending on, I think, your politics or your beliefs. How do you begin to explain to people why and how important a march like Saturday's was and what you're doing every Tuesday is? Not the Madonna answer, either. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I think that the more we can make uh, public and the more we can make clear uh, voters, I wouldn't even say dissatisfaction, uh, to some extent loathing of right. this man, uh, the more uh, political manu uh, space it gives our elected officials to stand up against him. Um, you know, we show up at 3.3 million people show up, uh, your senators, your congressmen are hearing that. When people are calling their Congress member's office every week saying, do not allow them to repeal the Affordable Care Act, uh, they're hearing them. Um, so I think that what this does is bring to light uh, what many, the majority of Americans voted yeah. feel. Um, uh, and it sort of gives space for elected officials to stand up to him and pressures them to do so. Now, I don't think this ends here. This has to continue into the 2017 elections in New York City uh, and the 2018 elections across the country. So we need to get rid of the folks who are going to work with this guy and pass his destructive agenda, and we need to support our, the elected officials that are willing to stand up and uh, fight against them. So what's the plan for rolling out the Working pa Families Party across the nation? Um, so uh, we have already taken the model that we created in New York State and expanded to, uh, I think, 12 states around the country now. Um, and have, they've been doing some incredible work. In New Jersey, they've passed paid sick days in a number of cities across the state. Um, in uh, Maryland and D.C., they're instrumental in raising the minimum wage in those states and in D.C. and the city. Um, so they've been doing good work, and there is a, and I think since the election we've seen more and more of it, yeah. a hunger for a independent, pol uh, progressive political organization, uh, effective political organization across the country. And so we're working with a number of uh, community groups, labor unions, activi uh, women's activists, Bernie activists, um, to sort of build those coalitions in states across the country um, and export the model. And so before we run out of time, where do people find out more about the NY Working Families Party, and how do they get involved in your causes? Sure. So uh, the Resist Trump Tuesday events are happening every Tuesday. You can go to workingfamilies.org and see where there's one happening near you. Uh, we'll have some in New York City. Uh, in fact, there was stuff all across New York State and all across the country yesterday. So uh, we'll have more of those, and you can find them on our website. So in a year from now, we're going to have you back. So I'm going to ask this. So make a note <laughs> one year from now. How long do you think we're going to have this level of activism and people using their bodies and their lives and their time to resist Donald Trump? I think so long as uh, Donald Trump continues to push a racist and xenophobic and misogynist agenda, uh, one that doesn't take care, that was, doesn't protect workers, that doesn't protect women, that doesn't respect immigrants and Muslims, the more you're going to see people out there. Ari Kamen, great job. Thank you. Yeah, we'll see you running for office. Are you going to run for mayor this year? Uh, no. <laughs> okay, well, we appreciate the work that you do, and we appreciate you for being on BK Live. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Ari.